morning and thank you for joining us today. In a couple of weeks, we can all be back together again, but for now, we're glad we can meet together online. I'm going to continue with last week's theme, that of meeting the God of second chances. And last week, we looked at Abraham and we saw that we get second chances because God is faithful. God is faithful even when we are faithless. God is faithful even when we mess up his plan. God is faithful even when we make mistakes, the same mistakes, again and again and again. God is faithful, and that should motivate us to active faith and obedience, not apathy. Now, last week we looked at Abraham. Today we're going to look at another Bible great, another person who needed a second chance. And we're looking at these people because we want you to know I want to know, even the greatest of genuine believers can do evil things and need second chances. So today we're going to focus on David. Let's remember who David was. He was a shepherd boy. He was very devoted and loyal to God. In fact, this shepherd boy went and fought the giant Goliath. Why would he do that? Because he was concerned about God's honor. He wasn't concerned to promote himself, but he said, somebody should stick up and kill this giant who keeps insulting our God, the God of Israel. So he trusted God and went and fought and defeated this giant. He was anointed king, but it wasn't time for Saul to leave yet. Saul's term wasn't over, but David was the one who was going to replace Saul. Saul knew that, and so Saul went out and tried to kill David. In fact, David had to run and hide because Saul was after him. But you know what? In spite of this, when David had opportunities to kill Saul, he says, no, I'm not going to do that. When God chooses to remove Saul, then I'll become king, not until. Basically, we see that David was, as the Bible describes, a man after God's own heart. The Psalms were written by David, and look at all the spiritual insight and depth in all those Psalms. You might wonder, how could David ever mess up so bad that he would need a second chance? Well, he did, and he really messed up, and he really needed a second chance. Let me tell you about it. It all started one spring when kings like David normally go off to war on military campaigns. But one year, he did not go off to war. Instead, he sent his top general, Joab, to go instead. The Israelite army was having success, and that part was good. But David and what he did back in Jerusalem was not. Let me read from 2 Samuel 11:2. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. David was idle, not off fighting like he should have been. He saw a woman and he lusted for her. He found out who she was and he coveted this woman and sent for her. In spite of the fact that he had many wives, he felt like he had to have this woman. He committed adultery. He committed adultery with Uriah's wife. Well, who was was Uriah? Well, Uriah was one of David's most loyal soldiers. He was a part of a group called the Mighty Men of David, the Thirty. This group is a group that goes all the way back to when David was a fugitive hiding from Saul, when he was out in the wilderness being hunted down by Saul. A group of friends voluntarily came around him and says, we will protect you, we will fight you. They were called his mighty men, and they risked their lives to save and protect David's life. Uriah was one of that 30. And right now, Uriah was out fighting the war while David was staying back in the palace, He should have been fighting with Uriah, but he was out there. He was not there. He was back in Jerusalem, forcibly taking Uriah's wife. Now, maybe David could have gotten away from this. But in 2 Samuel 11, 4, we also read, Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I'm pregnant. David's got a problem, but he came up with a solution. And I'm going to tell you about that instead of read that. But it goes like this. David sent word to Joab that Uriah should be sent home for some R&R, some rest and recovery. He thinks that Uriah will come home, he will go visit his wife, he will have sex with her, and that everyone will assume the child that Bathsheba was carrying was actually the result of Uriah's visit home. David was now involved in deception. However, Uriah, when he came home, He did not go home. He came back to Jerusalem, yes, but instead of going to his home, he slept at the entrance to the king's palace. 
What a strange thing to do. He didn't even go to a hotel. He didn't go. He basically slept right in front of the king's gate of his palace. That was concerning to David. So he asked, why did you do that? Why didn't you go home? Here's what he says in 2 Samuel 11, 11. Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my master Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open fields. How can I go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Ouch. That's a big ouch because it's a direct indictment on what David was doing. David was eating and drinking and living with his own wives as well as the wife of another man. And even while his loyal soldier, his extremely loyal soldier, Uriah, the husband of the wife of the woman he's taken, was out there fighting a battle. And look how, how he was. Basically, you were saying wars going on. The soldiers are out there. I can't indulge myself. But David, on the other hand, was doing that very same thing. Uriah was far more noble than David. David's plan of deception failed, so he came up with another plan, murder, the murder of Uriah. Again, let me summarize what happens. Uriah gets back up to the front line, and when he comes back, he carries a written message from David to Joab, to the general in charge. And the message says, put Uriah in the front line and order a dangerous mission so that Uriah will get killed. You know, go on that attack and then, and then have the men pull back so Uriah is left out by himself and he gets killed. He didn't really say that. He didn't use his words, but basically he says, I want you to get Uriah murdered. So Joab gave the order. They went on the attack, and sure enough, Uriah is killed. In 2 Samuel eleven twenty six, we read this. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time of mourning was over, David brought her to his house, and she became his wife. Well, it looks like he might be able to practice his deception after all. But let's summarize David's sins. He lusted, he coveted, he committed adultery, he deceived, he murdered, he stole a woman, he broke most of the Ten Commandments. In addition, he corrupted others, those that brought her to him, those that helped kill Uriah and Bathsheba herself. He tarnished the glory of God, he disobeyed and dishonored God. And as we read in 2 Samuel eleven twenty-seven, but the thing David had done displeased the Lord. I think that's a bit of an understatement. It was evil in the eyes of God. But what's going to happen? Is David going to get away with it? Well, let me read again from 2 Samuel, but starting at chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb. He bought, he raised it, it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to visit him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserved to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. That is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your mother's house to you, your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah and all that, that if all that had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, we're going to go some further in the story and, and further what's going on. But before we do this, I want to pause and make something clear. Everyone is capable of doing evil deeds and needs second chances. We're highlighting Abraham and now David, great people of the Bible who needed second chances. But I could have highlighted others. We could have added Moses. He murdered. We could add Peter. He denied Christ three times. We could add Paul. He persecuted and had Christians killed. If they could do such evil, everyone, you and I, are capable of it too. We may not do evil like they did, but we're capable of it. You probably don't think so. You might think some people, but not me. And you may be right, right this instant you won't. But the seeds of such evil lie in every human heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who? 
can understand that. It's not wishful thinking. It's not just wishful thinking, but it's illogical to believe that we are so inherently good, we can't do evil things too. Thousands of years of human history have proved that we are capable of evil. Think about Nazi Germany during World War II. How could the people who gave us Mozart and Bach produce such genocide? How could it be people you would have met on the weekend and they seem just as nice and pleasant as could be, could go in on Monday work in a concentration camp? The seeds of evil are in every human heart. It seems as if every time there's a highly publicized crime act takes place and you go and you ask the friends, the neighbors, the family of the criminal, they're shocked. They say, how could he done that? He seemed like such a nice guy. He seemed like a such person. I, I can't believe it's the same person. The world would not imagine it, but people are capable of doing evil. Now, thankfully that evil doesn't break out in its most extreme forms and I pray it won't break out to us, but it will, at least to lesser degrees. Great people do evil, and maybe because of their greatness, their evil is even greater. But average people like you and me are capable of doing evil too. 1 John 1.8 says this, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We all have within us the potential to sin and do evil. If Abraham, Moses, David, Peter, and Paul had the potential to do it, so do you and I. So don't say, no, not me. That's the worst thing you could do because it causes you to drop your guard and not be prepared. Little seeds grow over time into big trees. Acorns are small. Oak trees are big. Oak trees start as acorns. Self-pity, resentment, envy, jealousy, pride, arrogance, hurt, self-centeredness, if tolerated, if nurtured, watered and fed, can grow to become great evil. I wonder how far David's evil would have gone if something had not happened. What would have you done next? We don't know because God did do something. He sent the prophet Nathan to speak to him and confront him. Now, the purpose of Nathan's confrontation was restoration, not condemnation. Nathan confronted David not to destroy him, but to restore him. It was to bring conviction and change in David's life. God does not want me or you to go and denounce somebody or to set them up to the point where they give up on life and they quit and they say there's no hope. It's easy for us to condemn a person in such a way that raises their defense mechanism so high that they'll never repent, they'll never want to change. That's not what God wants. That's not God's way. He doesn't want people to give up and quit. He wants them to take a second chance, to repent and turn to him. And that's why he tells this kind of story to David so David can figure it out rather than just come and confront David directly. You see, our natural response is to minimize our sin and to make a case for why we deserve a second chance. David could have done that. He could have said, hey, I was the king. I can do those things. You know, it's my divine right. And Uriah was a soldier. He knew the risk of war. I just brought Bathsheba into my house because she no longer had a husband and needed someone to take care of her but he didn't do that. David could have made quite a case why he deserved a second chance. Why, I should get a second chance. I fought and killed Goliath. No one else would do that. I didn't kill Saul. I took care of Saul's grandson rather than killing all of Saul's descendants. God, I've worshiped you the right way. I've never engaged in idolatry. And I wrote all those Psalms. He could have made promises that he was going to do great things for God in the future. God, I will do this. Now, We naturally kind of do those things, don't we? We naturally kind of say why we deserve a second chance. The bad things really aren't that big a deal, and I'm going to do some more good things for you, God, so give me a second chance. But David didn't do that. Here is what he said when he was confronted by by Nathan. In 2 Samuel 12, 13, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. This is the response that Nathan hoped for, and this is why he told the story. He could have condemned David, but that wasn't his goal. His goal was repentance, and that's what he got. Oftentimes, we point out someone's sin, not because we want them to repent, but so we can condemn them and feel self-righteous and feel better than them. But that was not Nathan's goal. That was not God's goal, and that should never be our goal. The goal is repentance that leads to a second chance. David got his second chance. 
2 Samuel 12, 13 goes on to say, Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. God wants to forgive and give second chances. He generously offers them to all. We sometimes are reluctant to do that, but you know, we shouldn't be. He wasn't reluctant to give Abraham second chances. He wasn't reluctant to give David second chances, Moses, Peter, Paul. He's not reluctant. Listen to what Ezekiel 33, 11 says. Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? God is slow to anger, quick to forgive. He sent Jesus because he did not want anybody to perish. We've got to understand that although God wants people to acknowledge their sin, he wants to forgive people their sin. He is slow to anger, quick to forgive. Now to understand this some more, I want us to look at Psalm 51. And this was another of the Psalms that David wrote. And he wrote it basically in response to the situation he was having here, where he was uh, committed adultery and murdered. He was confronted by Nathan and he wants to cry out to God. So some more thoughts about how we can turn to God can be found by looking at Psalm 51. So let me read that to you. I'm not gonna read it all, I'll just read the first, oh, I think it's, it's 12 verses. Uh, and then we'll talk about it in detail. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sins are always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness, even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. In the Psalm, David shows us the right way to repent, the right way to respond when we need a second chance. Basically, he shows us God's way to get a second chance. And it really starts with this. Humble yourself before God. Humble yourself before God. You see, I think that's the number one thing that separates those who get second chances for those who don't get second chances. You have to have humility to seek a second chance, to want a second chance, to receive a second chance. Second chances come, but only come to those who are humble enough to accept them. Well, what is humility? It's to recognize one's true condition of having fallen short of God's standard. It's to be free from pride and free from arrogance. It's the recognition that one needs help, help from God in the form of forgiveness and renewal and restoration. And it's not only knowing we need it, but being humble enough to accept it. You see, sometimes people know they need it, but they won't accept it. James says it this way in James 4.10, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. See, a lot of people want to be lifted up, but they don't want to humble themselves before the Lord. But humbling ourselves before the Lord is how we get second chances, how we get forgiven, how we get restored. And it's important because Psalm 18, 27 says, you save the humble, but bring low, low those whose eyes are haughty. Getting a second chance starts with having the right attitude. And that right attitude is humility. And then we go on what flows from that attitude. And one of the things that flows from the attitude of humility is to put your hope in God's nature, not your good deeds or your inherent goodness. Again, David could have focused on himself as we talked about before. He could have started writing this psalm and saying, God, remember all the great things I did. But he didn't do that because he knows that didn't matter. Even those great things he did didn't mean he deserved God's forgiveness. So what did he do? He didn't focus on himself, he focused on God. Listen again to what he wrote in Psalm 51, verses one and two. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from sin. His hope was in God's mercy, God's unfailing love, God's great compassion. His forgiveness and second chance were based on God and what God is like, not on himself. 
We get second chances because of God's nature, his loving mercy. And David knew his only hope really was God. He didn't deserve mercy. You and I don't deserve mercy, but we can have mercy because of who God is and what God is like. Not my nature, but God's nature. Not my character, but God's character. God's love and compassion is best seen in Jesus. Because of great, God's great love, Jesus died for us. God made Jesus, who never sinned, to be the offering of sin for us so that we could be right with God. When I told you we don't deserve a second chance, uh, we don't deserve a second chance, we remember we get these things because of God, not because of who we are. Now, we also need to actually agree with God about these things. We've got to agree with God that, that we've sinned. And, and this may seem obvious, but many people don't agree with God about their sin. What they do is they maintain that, well, what I've done is not really a sin, or if it is, it's just not a big deal. I don't need a second chance. I've not really done anything wrong. But not David. David doesn't respond that way. Listen again to what he says in Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict, and justified when you judge. David didn't say, there's nothing wrong with what I did. People oftentimes don't recognize the fact they've sinned against God, and that's a big problem. And that's one of our biggest problems, why people don't get second chances with God, because they don't even really admit that they need one. I read about an episode of Beverly Hills 90210 that illustrates this. Now, it was a popular show a few years back. I never watched it, but I did read this about this, and I think it illustrates the point real well. You see, in one episode in the series, Tori Spelling, one of the main characters, comes to her priest and says, I'm in love with this young man. Should I have sex with him? Now, listen to what the priest says. Now, remember, this is a TV show. This is not, you know, necessarily a real Catholic priest or Anglican priest. This is a TV show. But listen to what in the series they have the priest saying. The priest says, well, you know, it all depends. Only your heart can tell you what is right. Nobody else can tell you what's right or wrong. Your heart alone knows. And remember, no matter what you do, God will love you. Then, of course, she hugs him and says, thank you. Now, I don't think a real priest would have said that. But because the TV priest, you know, is a TV priest, he can basically say, well, you determine what is right or wrong for yourself. Do what your heart tells you to do. That's not what God would say. That's not right. Because if we go by our heart, you know what? We never do anything wrong because we always do what our heart wants. What you do when you do it from your heart is do what you want. And if you always do what you want, you can never say you do anything wrong. We only can think about something being wrong because there's a God outside of us, a God who determines what is right and what is wrong. And factually, you will never need a second chance if you get to decide what's right and wrong because you'll always think what you've done is right. We only need second chances when we finally realize that there is a God and we agree with God about what is right and wrong and we agree that we have sinned and not done what God would want us to. Now, what should the priest have said? Or probably what a real priest would say. No, God says that sex is for married couples, not just anyone you love. It's not just some recreational thing. It's for those who made a lifelong commitment to one another that have gotten married. David acknowledged his sin, and so must you and I. And we call this acknowledgement confession. It's just saying, God, what I did was wrong, and you said it was wrong. And then we need to ask for forgiveness and renewal. David does that. Listen to how he does that, in, uh, in, again, in Psalm 51, verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. The asking is important, but again, it's based upon the fact that God promises to forgive. It's not somehow that our asking convinces God to forgive us. Our asking somehow we say the right words and we say them with, a, with an, uh, enough sincerity. We say them over and over again that somehow it forces God or, or motivates God to forgive us that somehow our asking creates a, a willingness in God that wasn't there before. You know, God's got his arms folded across your says, I'm not going to forgive you. But because we ask and plead, God forgives. No, when we ask forgiveness, you know what we're doing? We're basically claiming what God wants to give us. He wants to forgive. He desires to forgive. He's basically just waiting for us to ask for it. It's kind of like a gift that he's going to give as soon as we ask. But we do need to ask to do it. We do need to ask for the forgiveness, and then God gives it to us.
But notice what also David said in verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. He's basically saying, God, I need forgiveness, but I also need newness. I don't want to go back to the same old behavior. I need for you to create in me a pure heart. I just don't want to press reset and go back and do the same thing over and over again. I want to be renewed. And some of us need to ask that. We can ask for forgiveness, but you know, part of what true repentance is, is not saying, forgive me what I did, but I might do it again. It's saying, Father, forgive me what I did and and created me a pure heart so I don't keep on doing that, so I don't return to my past poor habits, my past sinful behavior, my past unhealthy relationships. God wants to cleanse your heart. He wants to create in you a pure heart. And David says, renew a steadfast love in me. He's basically saying, God, I want to be loyal to you. That's what steadfast means. It means be loyal to you. Loyal sheep stay close to the shepherd. And so David asks God to use his sin, his brokenness, to grow him and mature him and draw him closer to God than before. He wants to live his old sinful way behind and be a new person, to have a new relationship with God. Well, we all need second chances. And these great genuine believers of the Bible tell us that even the greatest people can do very bad things and need second chances. If they need second chances, everybody needs second chances. I need second chances and you need second chances. God is eager to give those to people. God wants to do that. That's why he sent Jesus to the cross. Anybody that thinks that God doesn't want to forgive doesn't understand God. Why would God owe all the trouble for Jesus to go to the cross and then not quickly and willingly, eagerly forgive people and give them second chances? It's God's nature. And we see that nature of love and mercy in Jesus coming to earth, living on earth, dying on the cross, so that we can give second chances. And God gives second chances. He gives them to the humble. Those who agree with God that they've sinned and they need a second chance. Those who sincerely ask for forgiveness and ask to be made new. We get it not because we deserve it, not because we're so clever in asking for it or making promises, We do it basically because God's character is giving and merciful and kind and Jesus died for us so that he could offer forgiveness for our sins freely to all who will receive it, if we will. If you aren't a follower of Jesus, you need to become one because becoming a follower of Jesus is how you surrender your life to God. It's where you humble yourself before God and say, God, I know that I've done things wrong. I realize that my life has not been what you wanted. I've disobeyed you and broken your word and broken your commands. I want a new life. Will you forgive me? I put my faith in Jesus. I believe that Jesus' death on the cross is payment for my sin. I want to turn my life around and turn it toward you. I want that new life that you offer. Of course, if you're a believer in Christ, you've already had the experience of conversion. You've already had that new relationship. But we drift. We make mistakes. We don't do what we should. But we want to know that God also continually has this attitude of grace and mercy and kindness. It's not a one-time thing. And if you use up your one chance, you'll blow it. Then there aren't any more. No, God's mercies that we saw last week are new every morning. Every time we need it, the person who humbles himself and turns to God receives forgiveness and a second chance. You know, I'm going to pray in just a moment. I'm going to give you some time to pray as well. But before, I want to share with you something that probably many of you have heard, and and it's important for us to maybe say it again and again. But as we talk about this, and we talk about the fact that we are all sinful and we all can fall, it's only because we want you to realize that you're probably in bigger need of a second chance than you think. You know, we're all more sinful than we realize or that we want to admit. But what's even more important to know is this. We are loved and accepted in Jesus Christ more than we realize, even more than we can imagine. And that more than compensates, more than offsets all the sins that we could commit. Let me give you a few moments to talk to God, a few seconds, and then let me wrap up by praying. Father, you are such an amazing God that when we stop and pause, all we can do is is, is bow down and worship to you, to uh, sing words of praise to you, to, to be humbled by how awesome you are and how gracious and merciful you are. And Father, the more we know you and the more we see how holy and exalted you are, the more we realize how gracious and compassionate you are to, to welcome us and to receive us and offer us those second chances. 
Father, we pray that you'll always embrace them, that we will always embrace them, that we'll always humble ourselves and receive the forgiveness and new start that you offer to us. We pray that you'll help us to do this through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thanks for being with us today. If you'd like to talk about this some more, use the, the Connect card that you can find online to reach out to us so we can talk and make arrangements to discuss it some more. One of the things you want to do if you're going to want to become a follower of Jesus, you want to follow through on your faith and your repentance by being baptized into Jesus. And, and baptism is a great thing because in baptism, we, we confirm and solidify that decision we make to turn to God. And it's such a great thing because you have something very physical and objective and clear that says yes. I've turned to God. I've accepted his offer of forgiveness. I've been baptized into Jesus to wash away the old life and start a new one. So if you have questions about following Jesus or being baptized in him, please contact us by using the Connect card that you can find a link there online. Well, God bless you. Uh, stay with us today as we continue to worship God and as we take the Lord's Supper together.